Thank you so much for the intro and thank you for having me here. Um, so yeah, folks, I'm super excited to be here. My name is Ariana and I just on Friday defended my PhD at the University of California, San Diego. Um, and so this work was possible in large part because of a collaboration with the IT team at UCSD, where I've been working over the last year and a half as an embedded security researcher within their operations team. So a big thank you to that entire team and all the uh, truly amazing work they do. And so generally, my work has been broadly on understanding and improving security processes via large scale measurement. And today I'm going to talk about the theory and practice of vulnerability remediation and a very specific type of developer from a security lens, system administrators. <clears throat> And so many organizations, especially newer ones, have moved their organizational infrastructure into the cloud. AWS is large, GCP is large, and a lot of organizations have started to take advantage of that and move their physical hardware components into the cloud. So they no longer need to maintain the physical piece of hardware, but things are abstracted for them. However, not all organizations have or can do this. In fact, there are many organizations that have legacy machines, or in other terms, bare metal, the more canonical term, um, that are that still exist and are critical pieces of infrastructure. And UCSD is one of these such organizations where they definitely utilize cloud services, but there's just a ton of legacy systems that still exist physically on premise. And so the theory in an ideal world is that every piece of infrastructure in an organization that is on premise is up to date security wise. So you have system administrators who are the ones generally maintaining these pieces of bare metal who make sure that every piece of software and hardware is up to date and there's no issues. But the reality is that these disparate physical systems can affect the safety posture of an org, and they can have a large number of vulnerabilities that are very difficult to triage and maintain, and that an attacker can ultimately utilize to get into the system and thus the organization itself. And so this process of getting rid of vulnerabilities is called patching or vulnerability remediation, and I'll use those terms sort of interchangeably. And patching isn't a new problem. I know there are folks in this crowd who are probably nodding their head like, yeah, it is a pain, but it persists. And there are advances that have made patching an easier process, especially for organizations or parts of organizations that have been able to transition to cloud services like automation, abstraction. And the thing about a lot of these advancements is that they optimize for the machine, not the human. And so when you're in an organization that still has legacy systems on premise and still needs to maintain them, the question that I went out, set out to answer was, what if we tune the process for the human in the loop? What if we took the process and the technologies that are being employed and examined holistically how to make this process easier for the people doing the job. In other terms, how can we make patching a more effective process? And so we asked this question in our organization at UCSD, because like I said, I've been working as an embedded security researcher. And this was an issue that was continually coming up that, oh, we, you know, we're having difficulty getting people to patch. Um, and so in order to answer this question and examine how we can optimize for the human in the loop, um, we first have to examine what was being done before. And so I sat down with the team that was in charge of sending out these notifications. And this is an example of a notification that was sent out to folks within the IT team at our organization. It was essentially a weekly report um, that was meant to give the sysadmins information. You know, it's like, and just to read off bits of this, it says, the sys Systems below have active critical or high severities. Please patch within 24 hours. And then at the end of the email, it listed who's the technical contact, the host name, IP address, um, and then also listed a link for how they could get more information from Qualys, which is the third party tool that our organization utilizes for vulnerability scanning um, and information gathering. And looking at this, there were a couple things that stood out, um, especially having done a related work search in the literature. First, it required users to go and log in to Qualys. So it not only required them to do this additional step, but it required them to have a login to Qualys. And if any of you have worked in a large organization, you know that it is not always the easiest to get logins into third-party tools. The second thing that really stood out is that 
the email listed the raw number of vulnerabilities. So in this instance, there was one severity five, which is critical, and eight severity four, but it didn't list the type. It didn't give any other information. It really relied on the system administrator having access and having time in that moment to go log into Qualys to look up what are the sev fours, sev fives, and with any third uh, party tool, there are obviously issues, downtime, so this didn't help. And so what I'm trying to get at that this old notification was not ideal. It was a, a weekly notification, which is great in theory, but it did not list the vulnerabilities or additional details. It required these system administrators who were already juggling many jobs to perform extra steps to get the necessary information. And it adds this amount of friction that is required in order to execute. And so, again, working with the security team and taking best practices from security literature and looking at what has been done with vulnerability uh, notification, I worked with the team to craft a new notification and a new pipeline. And so this is the new notification that gets sent out. And the things that I want to draw your attention to is that one, each email focuses on a very specific type of uh vulnerability. So instead of sending a laundry list of here are the nine on your system or whatever, um, this focus is just on Microsoft Windows Security Update. Um, there were instructions on how to patch the system just in case this was a new vulnerability that they weren't aware of. Um, and at the end of this email, which is cut out in the screenshot, there was a CSV that was pulled from the third party tool that had a plethora of additional metadata. So it had the host name, the IP, but it also had things like the full vulnerability name, uh, this the CVE, other pieces of information that system administrators find really helpful. And so for this first step, to try and address how do we make patching a more efficient process, we examined the old notification, proposed changes that reduce effort and time from the system administrators, and crafted new notifications that had actual items focused on one vulnerability and listed all machines and vulnerability types in the attached CSV. But like I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, um, I do a lot of large scale quantitative uh, data analysis. And so we don't actually know whether these changes were effective, until we went and analyzed the subsequent data. And so I created an in-house pipeline that can be automatically run um, that takes all the pieces of information from the system administrator side and essentially produces a series of analyses that we can break down into different ways. Um, and in aggregate, we saw that because of these changes, the patching rate increased from 3% to 78%, which is a huge difference. This is already a success. But the natural next question was, why was the patch rate only at 78%? It seemed like we were doing everything right. We had looked at the related work, we're doing best practices, and it was still not at 100%. And so the beauty of data is that there are different ways to look and slice it. And so first I looked to see what different contacts, uh, how they were patching their machines. And we found that some contacts are just much better at patching. When we then looked at the vulnerability families, we found that certain vulnerability families get patched more. Things like Zoom, browsers, standalone applications were getting patched faster and at much higher rates than things like operating system distros like Red Hat. And the hypothesis there, which you know intuitively makes some sense, is that standalone applications that have easier patching processes were easier to prioritize because they don't require downtime for the system administrator. Because again, system administrators are juggling many jobs and many needs, including the needs of people who are using those machines. And then finally, we also found that some long families just take more time to patch. And so this is kind of um, following up from the, the last analysis, which is that there were some vulnerability families like operating system distros um, and like Microsoft Windows updates that just took more time. And we, again, the hypothesis that there is some overhead that is required there that was slowing the process down. But at this step, you know, we took a step back and we're like, okay, the quantity of data is telling us a lot, but we also conducted semi-structured interviews with the system administrators because we knew them, um, they knew us, to add the qualitative view to the quantitative data. And we learned a lot in these interviews. And some of the high-level takeaways was that, first off, the monotonicity of the old email notification made it really easy to ignore. And the reason that we were seeing a much higher patch rate with this new notification is because it wasn't the same thing every week. 
We also found that many teams have exception, exceptions. And this was actually super interesting for us because it uh, showed that there was a discrepancy between the vulnerability remediation notification pipeline and this exception pipeline. But there are some teams that have exceptions for various servers, various vulnerabilities, and they felt that that was getting incorporated in the vulnerability pipeline. And now that we know that there's a discrepancy, we are working on adding that in. We also found that notifications fall outside of the sysadmin's patch cycles. You know, if we sent an email on the second Tuesday, they hadn't gotten to patching around, uh, they hadn't gotten to patching the system yet because they were patching on the second week of that month. And so this added a lot of additional insight into why the patch rate was only at 78%. And overall, we found that there was very positive sentiment towards the new notification, but there was room for improvement and better integrations. And so... The, while the theory is that if you do everything right, then folks will just follow, the practice is that there are these very real blockers that you need to take into account, especially blockers that are unique to your organization. And so in summary, I looked at how we could increase the efficacy of patching within our organization. We applied some very basic principles to reduce friction for system administrators and in aggregate increase the patch rate from 3 to 78%. Um, but additionally, we found that by uh, interviewing the system administrators, many of them had a positive sentiment towards this new notification and that there were discrepancies in different systems that we can work on to make it even more accurate and more productive moving forward. And with that, I'm happy to take questions and I'm also happy to take questions offline at these various pieces of online communication. Thank you so much. Fantastic. Thank you so much for a great and engaging presentation, kicking off this last hour. Um, so uh, again, audience, please make sure you're putting any questions that you have uh, into the chat. We have a few minutes, so I am going to kick off with a clarification question that probably sure. would be a pretty easy answer. So like the vulnerability vulnerability families that you mentioned. I think that's a really interesting uh, concept, obviously, helps us think about that space. Is that a direct mapping to the kind of technology that's being built? Or is that kind of like with security vulnerabilities where there's like ways to think about the types of security vulnerabilities that you have, regardless of the platform or the context or domain? Yeah, really good question. So when I say vulnerability families, um, it's actually kind of a mix of both. So it is very specific security vulns, but for the given applications that were on the servers. And so, you know, like okay. Zoom, Zoom, for example, has um, various like RCE vulnerabilities. But if a server that a system administrator was managing didn't have Zoom, we didn't notify them on that. It was we only right. notified them on the application and then also the type of vulnerability. And so um, I, I guess to clarify a little bit further, the emails focused on applications. And then yeah. the CSV, the thing that was helpful for sysadmins is that we then listed in the CSV the different types of security Vulns because okay. different teams have different threat models. You know, some of teams course. are like, we're going to prioritize, prioritize X over Y. And so it was useful that, for them to know how many of X versus Y there were. Absolutely. 